was I was always interested in 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 in, in, in art, but I didn't know that you could, it was a career, obviously. Um, and um, I was always drawing, always drawing, but uh, academically I wasn't very good. Um, I was I was dyslexic, but I wasn't sort of um, diagnosed. So I had this idea of myself sort of not being well, being slow. And I was the guy with the sort of patch over the eye with the glasses. So being dyslexic and having this patch over your, your eye, sort of, um, it was just one of those kind of uh, um, you know, disadvantages. Disadvantages. Well, as well as being a black child at that time in the eighties. Um, and I had one talent, uh, which was I could draw. So did you, I'll, we'll come to the slides sure. in a moment, but so I'd just like to ask, I mean, you had a talent for drawing. Mm -hmm. You didn't think that that could be a career, but you nevertheless went to art school, you went to Chelsea to be a painter. Yeah, I mean, what, what happened was that um, I, I, I was, I remember, <laughs> so I had to reset my exams and I was in Southwall. Um, to do sort of manual labour sort of um, work because they thought, okay, this guy's not going to pass his A levels, so you know, just in case he could, you know, you do class in plumbing and um, plumbing and bricklaying. And I remember being very depressed and uh, talking to this guy who was the, the head of the plumbing school. I said, I really don't want to be. I, want, I really want to do art. He goes, well, you should, you should go and do it then. He said to me in a very sort of stern way, like um, it wasn't like. It wasn't being aggressive or sort of a flippant, but it was just almost like, well, do what you think you should do. So I went and uh, that was it. Went to the art school and then uh, went to did A level art and, and that was it. Never looked back. I mean, it was just one of those situations where there was a door open, half open, not even half open, a little bit open, a little bit of light peeking through, and I thought, okay, let's, let's, let's run for it. And that was it. Let's move on to, we'll talk about art school and mm -hmm. goldsmiths and so on in a moment, but let's come back to the work on view in Helston. It's a two part work. Yeah. Those, those of you who've seen the installation will, will be aware that this is the work that you see on the monitor. It's a short piece, less than a minute, filmed in Iraq, filmed after you'd been embedded in the British yeah. Army. It's filmed in, in, in Basra, uh, yeah. in Iraq. Um, I, was, I was appointed to be the war artist, um, the official war artist, I think, in uh, 2003. Um, 2002, 2003, and I went to Basra, and uh, it was one of those situations where I, I was really embedded with the troops there, um, because they wouldn't allow me to sort of be out of their sight, and uh, it was just one of those strange things. I mean, never been, you know, uh, you know, in, uh, you know, in, in, with, with the military before, never being in Iraq before, never being sort of uh, in a war zone, um, and it was just one of those things where I just, I just sort of looked around, kept, kept looking around, and I was very frustrated because I couldn't find anything there that I could actually get a grip on. And um, that's when I sort of came up with the thing with called Queen and Country, because it was all about these guys who were writing back home. And I thought, okay, war, war letters and uh, the whole idea of the, the history of those, of the you know, war letter. I mean, especially from the First World War. And this building was the only thing that I saw which was sort of accessible to me. And it was a, it was a, it was a bomb that had gone through the whole building. There's a sort of a precision strike by the Americans. <laughs> But it didn't explode. Um, it was embedded, so it's gone through about three or four, um, well, uh, five sort of floors, stories with this hole. You see it in, in the uh, piece that's sort of this sort of circular, sort of almost like um, uh, I don't know uh, what you could say, Gordon Matter Clark sort of this you know, sort of dissection of the building. Um, and this is what was remaining of it um, after it sort of plunged into the earth. But that's the, exploded. that's the only work that you made. That's the only film that you made. While you were in Iran, how long were you there for? I was there for uh, about uh, ten days. And you were working on Super Eight. Super Eight, yeah. Which is a medium that you've used on many occasions, where in circumstances where you can't take a large camera. Yeah, absolutely. And also, it's one of those. It's, again, it, it's the it's the um, it's the it's the how can I say it's the camera that allowed me taught me how to direct because it was when I was um, at film school the first time I had a Super Eight camera. This is of course there were transitioned into digital cameras, but it was very expensive then. So Super 8 still was a, a, a kind of a viable medium. Because the film stock was so expensive, um, I what you shot had to had to be thought out. So nowadays people shoot willy-nilly because they've got, you know, they shoot like you know, three hours of footage, 24 hours of footage to cut something down to half an hour. Well then, for me, it, every every frame was like 50 pence, <laughs> so you had to be sure what you were going to sort of shoot. So in fact, it was editing in my head before I took out the camera. 
you know, what do I need? It was like, a, you know, what it was, it was like a golf, being a golfer. You don't have six, seven strokes at it. You have one, one go at it. So there's a kind of, it's much more um, precise. And you think, think through it. Think, so you think things throughout. So you think things uh, through a little bit more in a way to get closer to what you want. So it was very. It's, it's, it's been a very. It was it was the best way of actually learning how to shoot film. We'll talk about Queen and Country in a moment. Sure. But this this piece. I mean, it's a very abstracted view of what happens in a war. Very. And you were there for you just said ten days, to fortnight. Mm -hmm. You were closely involved with the, with soldiers. Yeah. I don't know whether they were fighting or not, but you didn't record anything other than this simple simple image. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's it's kind of I didn't want to you know you get into a situation where you get news newsreel footage of you know soldiers. I mean, I, I did a, you know we did sort of uh, night patrols and stuff like that, and uh, you know there was a situation where it was you've seen those images before. This kind of military sort of uh, news news sort of footage images, and it was I was trying to look for something which was sort of a what one wouldn't see. Well, it wasn't. It was all about, in some ways, this sort of undercurrent. The whole idea of this this bomb, you know, going through five floors and it's still being alive. It's sort of it, the whole idea of it being still. Um, how can I say it's it, it's still alive right now? I mean, this, uh, you know, how you get fired these bombs, you know, from the Second World War. You know, and recently, you met, you met, I imagine from London City Airport, there was that bomb there that, that exploded. It's, it's this whole idea of this tension, which is still there. The evidence of things not seen, in, in a way. You know, you know, what's actually still there, was still sort of um, implanted, embedded in the soil. But you had this film, mm -hmm. you had it for three or four years, before you yes. turn it into a work, yes. which is unexploded. Yes. So what happens during that period in your mind? It's in my head, I know I have it. Um, but it's, I mean, again, it's, it's the right time to bring it out and, and actually what it what, what it can link itself to and bringing it to the sort of surface in a way to sort of complement um uh um great sense. Great sense, excuse me that's <laughs> what happens let's, um, let's move to the next slide yeah. could we which of course is gravesend yeah. we've got a couple of slides of from gravesend so you say it complements gravesend in what way does it complement it um uh well, I, it, of course, it's two different sort of uh, places in the world. I, I feel I, it's just this whole idea of in, embedded, um, this whole thing about sort of awakening um, things which are embedded, um, one planted, of course, and one sort of being sort of resurfaced, um, one to say that man-made, and one sort of organic. Um, and it was just that sort of idea of sort of technology, uh, the whole idea of the whole idea of this sort of manual labor, this sort of um, you know sort of crude manual labor to sort of make something like, which is in everyone's pocket, just a, a cell phone. Because what they, what in 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 the uh, uh, graves in graves. So for those who haven't seen Gravesend, you'll be aware that it's a piece which looks at mining in the Congo, the yeah. mining of coal tar, mineral which is used in electronic. Uh, yeah, equipment uh, yeah. of all kinds. Digital electronic equipment of all kinds. What it is, it's a conductor. It doesn't overheat. Mm. So, for example, um, you know, just before I actually went to the Congo, I think it's '98. I think um, there was the production of a PlayStation, PlayStation production. And what happened was there was it was there was over there was oh, there was a huge demand for coal time because of this production of this um, video game. Um, as well as other things. So, you know, doctors and lawyers were leaving the hats and canes behind and going into the bush digging to dig this stuff out because it was, at that time, it was like, it was like $100, uh, I don't know, a grand, I don't know what it was. It was, it was, it was, it was, it was an immense amount of money for a small amount of, of coal time. So, therefore, a lot of people were going in there um, to, to dig this stuff out. And when I first went to, to investigate it in, in, to, you know, in the Congo, it was this a strange place. We, this is a place called Wali Kali. And you, you, you to Google put that on Google Maps it's like in the middle of nowhere, um, and it was pretty it was pretty dangerous. I, mean, I didn't realize at the time it was one of those strange, uh, uh, yeah, it was one of those strange sort of uh, it, it treks in, in, into the bush. It's odd. So again, I think you just said that you were there in '98. This film was issued 
issued in 2007, so it yeah. sat there again for a long period of time, just hating. Well, well, I wasn't there. I think that was, I, I was, I, I was talking about the sort of the, the production of, uh, um, Coltan. No, sorry, the production of the PlayStation, which actually yeah. rose the, the price up of Coltan. And actually what they did was they stockpiled it, so therefore they brought it down. So it's, it's all, you know, it's all bad manipulation and, and, and it, it's all just the and sort of exploitation really of what's going on there. And the extraordinary thing, of course, about Gravesend, as with so many of your own works, is this very, very strong sense of the visceral, mm. very strong sense of sound. I mean, these are light and dark. These are all components that come again and again in your work, Steve. And in particular, I suppose, going and seeing the installation of Gravesend, you're very conscious of the fact that the sound assaults you mm. even before you get into the space, while you're watching Unexploded. You are. You hear this, for instance, the, you know the cracking of mm -hmm. the ore in the vice. Mm -hmm. I mean, those kinds of very, very strong visceral senses yeah. come through again and again in your work. Well, I think particularly this work, I just wanted people to go on a journey. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the whole idea of you know when you think of someone's. I mean, just going back, you know, to even sort of uh, Orson Welles's um, sort of uh, radio uh, um, play of of of. Um, the book Heart of Darkness. It is this sort of, you know, visceral sort of, um, you know, narrative um, where it drags you, you know, from one place to another. Um, and particularly radio for me, I mean, I was a kid, the radio sound is just amazing. Just, in, you know, more than say, I was TV, where you're looking at someone, you know, going through the sort of bush with a cutlass. As when you're listening to someone, you're there with them. So the whole idea of this journey, the whole idea that you'll, you'll see if you if you see the piece of the, the sort of black organic sort of um, sort of uh, flow, as it, well that is actually the, a map of the of, of the Congo River, uh, as, you know, Conrad, you know, Conrad is going down into the Congo River, and also of course it's the source, one of the sources of of, of the coltan, which you see in the uh, in, in the artwork. So I wanted to have a situation where it is a visual sort of journey. That you're involved in 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 in, in a, in a uh, more than a better word a real way. So you're sort of experiencing uh, an actual journey rather than just observing one. You've referred to the graphic mm. of the Congo. Mm. So at what point did that come into the piece? I mean, you 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 go to the Congo. Mm -hmm. What happens? You find the oh, mine. Dust, yeah. You take a lot of images, not knowing how you're going to use them, or do you already have an idea about how you're going to use them? I think you have half an idea, but you're sort of, I mean, again, I don't have a, you know, I, I, I tend not to, and I think it's the best way to be in, in this situation, any situation, I think, if I make a feature film, is not to go there with a stencil. Go, go into a situation where you're sort of open to what is presented to you, and you sort of um, galvanize what's there, and, 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 and actually it's almost like a, it seems like you try to sort of be a, a Tai Chi artist in a way. You try to, you know, move move with it and how you corral what you are experiencing into something which you want to present. Um, that's how I operate in, in, in a way. And it's, uh, that's, that for me, is the only way to operate. Um, I don't have a preempted idea of how to present anything because it has to sort of tell me what it wants. But a film yeah. like Grey's End is made of a series of composite elements. You talked about yeah. graphic. Yeah. Let's have the next slide. So, uh, a series of slides that were taken in Grey's End. So this particular location uh, did a little research and this is where um, this location is, uh, is where the book Heart of Darkness starts when Conrad recites his journey in the Congo. So this we found at the exact location, just through sort of research and blah blah. And this this, this is the, 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 the place where the boat was docked, and he recites his, his his journey. So I want to make that sort of that sort of uh, connection uh, from you know the Thames to the Congo. This kind of flow. So it was yeah movement flow. Again, you know it's it's the sort of this this whole sort of uh, journey, and it's just it's just you know the. the this journey, you know, I was just interested in, in that as well as, okay, good. So, yes, yeah, so I'm sort of coming back. So it was like, okay, so what's interesting for me about the whole idea also of, 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 of Conrad and, and the Belgians and, uh, and um, um, King Leopold, for example, the second uh, Belgian, the whole idea of the Industrial Revolution and the whole idea of rubber, 
So the whole idea of uh, of this the def the industrial revolution in, in, in you know and and, and motor cars and and, 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 and and conveyor belts and so forth and rubber how rubber became this huge sort of a, a, a sort of a ingredient in the industrial revolution sort of to to to, to call time and going and also going back into the Congo of course and uh, you know with with Conrad uh, sorry with Leopold II and uh, this whole the brutality of that. And, and gathering rubber, and if you didn't have enough, you didn't gather. If, you had, if each individual person hasn't gathered enough rubber, the left hand will be cut off. Mm. And that sort of uh, get that kind of uh, consolidates into the whole idea of photography too, because at that time the first portable, um, the first portable Kodak cameras were available, and they uh, some okay they some of the priests had portable um, Kodak cameras. Uh, the, the, the sort of uh, what we call the missionaries, missionaries in that country. So the first atrocity which was exposed by photography was in the Congo when they brought back photographs of you know the, the native people whose hands were cut off because they hadn't brought back enough rubber. So for me, and also I said, oh, just doing mass, and that kind of collided uh, uh, for me. It was in my head the whole idea of, of the next revolution, well, another revolution, the digital revolution, and Coltan. Every single person has a bit of it. I mean, if you have a portable, a portable phone or a TV set or whatever computer, you have call time. So interestingly, how that sort of, for me, it was very, uh, it, it, it sort of, it was, it was just about then and now and how it just, just and the call, you know, again, sorry, go. Um, yeah. the, yeah. the, the Congo, call time, rubber, blah, 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 uh, different kinds of imperialisms. We'll come back to the whole question of the relationship between the first.